our keynote speaker, uh, Greg Bialecki. Uh, now, the term expert uh, can be tossed around loosely, as many terms are tossed around loosely these days. But in, in Greg Bialecki, uh, we have a true expert on cutting edge strategies to target infrastructure investments strategically for smart economic development. Greg has over 30 years of experience in real estate development within both the public and private sectors with a focus on planning and permitting of large scale mixed use urban redevelopment projects. In his current job as a, a principal with Redgate, which is a strategic real estate investment and advisory firm, Greg directs site acquisition, due diligence, and financing activities for residential and mixed use projects. He's skilled at identifying promising sites for new urban neighborhoods uh, and creating development outcomes that work for all uh, constituencies. Uh, prior to joining Red, Redgate, uh, Greg served, as I had alluded to before, as the cabinet secretary for what's known in Massachusetts as the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, which is pretty analogous to the currently constituted Commerce RI uh, here. Uh, in that position, he was actively engaged in promoting mixed-use transit-oriented developments that included multifamily housing. In Massachusetts, they get the fact that housing is an integral part of economic development. Here in Rhode Island, we're still struggling, I think, to have that widely accepted, but hopefully that will come. Uh, under Greg's leadership, his office received the Robert C. Larson Workforce Housing Public Policy Award from the Urban Land Institute in 2013. There's more about Greg in your packets, but uh, in order to uh, give him as much time as possible, I'm going to ask him now to uh, share his insights with us. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great time, I think, to have this discussion that we're having this morning. Those of us in Massachusetts uh, who uh, watch Rhode Island and its progress and its success are excited to see that the Rhode Island economy is beginning to gain some momentum. I think uh, many of us in Massachusetts feel that a good part of that is due to leadership of Governor Raimondo and uh, her willingness to think differently about economic development and government's role in economic development. Uh, I know that um, there are ways in which Massachusetts and Rhode Island think of themselves as competitors and, and act like competitors, but it was always my view and Governor Patrick's view um, that we're all collectively now competing in a very global economy. We're excited to see about the momentum that the Rhode Island economy has. And this morning, of course, we're here to talk, uh, as Scott mentioned, as Governor Patrick used to say, the unglamorous work of government, which is infrastructure, so vital, um, but hard to get people to focus on. So it's great that uh, we're all here doing that for a morning today. Uh, and our role, again, is in a similar vein to say, to talk about how can we think differently about public uh, investments uh, in infrastructure and are there ways that we can do it smarter and more successfully uh, for the sake of both economic development and housing, uh, as Scott mentioned. So my role here this morning to start us off, uh, I would like to tell you why, briefly. Uh, I believe that it's a good idea for a state uh, to make at least some of its infrastructure investments in a targeted way that supports private investment in jobs uh, and housing. I'm going to call those uh, targeted infrastructure investments. And uh, Scott has already uh, made reference to this, but um, we felt very strongly in Massachusetts that it was important uh, to make these targeted investments in support of both uh, economic development, typical job creation opportunities, but also uh, housing creation opportunities. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple and it applies equally to Rhode Island as to Massachusetts. Uh, in this 21st century economy, um, we've seen a flip. It used to be that the businesses located where they wanted to locate, uh, and if you wanted a job at one of those places, uh, then you found your way to get there. You went to where the work was. And now we've had almost a 180 degree flip. Uh, and the businesses are saying, Where's the talent? Where's the workforce? Uh, I'm going to go and find them. I want to be close to them, and the places where they are are the places that I want to be. So for any state that is trying to grow a 21st century economy, in addition to the typical uh, tools to use to try to att att attract and retain and grow businesses, uh, you're also thinking, uh, what do I do to make this, how do I attract and retain 
my talent pool, and if I do that successfully, then the businesses are going to want to uh, want to be here. So, just to give you a quick example of those kind of targeted investments. So, what I'm talking about is an investment in public infrastructure, um, but that is directly tied to uh, a private investment. So, simple example: extending the sewer line out to the business park that, or expanding that sewer line that allows a manufacturing facility to grow. Uh, putting in the traffic improvements uh, that support the growth uh, of an office building or, or a mixed-use development, but something that's really targeted very specifically uh, at the growth of a property or a district of, or a neighborhood of your city or town or your state. Now, uh, I'm going to make the argument about why spending some of our precious public infrastructure dollars on those kind of targeted investments makes sense. Of course, most of our public infrastructure investments are and probably always will be more systemic uh, ones. And the goals of these investments is to maintain or improve our roadway systems, our transit systems, water and wastewater in ways that benefit all or almost all of our citizens. And that's happening here in Rhode Island. So for example, Governor Raimondo has uh, her road works program uh, trying among other things to address this issue that we have in Massachusetts as well of uh, structurally deficient bridges, uh, and we have so far behind in our upkeep, as you know, that many of the bridges here in Rhode Island, same in Massachusetts, are ranked by the federal government as being structurally deficient. It would be great to think that we had a plan to uh, catch up and fix all of those, uh, but realistically, the amount of money that we have uh, available, Governor Patrick's goal in a, in a similar program, the Accelerated Bridge Program, wasn't to fix them all over the course of four or eight years, but at least get to a point where there were more bridges getting fixed than were deteriorating in any given year, so that when the federal government came around the next time, the number of structurally deficient bridges was at least, at least a little less than it was the prior year, as opposed to more and more and more as it been for decades. So those kinds of systemic issues uh, are where most of our infrastructure dollars go, where where you, yours will go. Uh, but what we have learned in Massachusetts, we think we have some proven success over the last 10 years, uh, is that there's great value in taking at least some of these precious infrastructure funds and making them available for targeted investments that support and in a way match, if you will, uh, private investments in jobs and housing. So when I say taking some of those funds, um, I really do mean a modest uh, amount. The program, uh, one of the programs we have in Massachusetts, you can hear more about today, MassWorks program. Uh, we originally started with about $50 million a year. I think Governor Baker's grown it to about $100 million a year. Um, but that's against about $2 billion capital spending budget that we have in Massachusetts. So we're talking about maybe 5%, two, three, four, five percent uh, of our total capital spend is on these targeted investments. So uh, it, it really is, we've, we've shown some value just by using a small uh, amount of the total funding. And by the way, I say, when I say match a public investment that matches a private investment, I, I'm also talking about an opportunity to get a lot of leverage. So this is I'm not talking about a one-to-one -one match program. I'm talking about, for example, uh, spending a million dollars to maybe extend a sewer line or expand a sewer line, and that's enabling and supporting a private investment that could be $5 million, $10 million, $15 million more. So really uh, getting an awful lot of leverage off those uh, targeted public uh, investments. So as I mentioned, we're in an era of very tight public budgets and uh, underinvested in infrastructure, deteriorating infrastructure, so how do, would we justify taking money out of that budget to uh, do those systemic repairs, even a small amount of money? How do we justify uh, doing that these days? And I think there's two fundamental reasons why we think it's made sense in Massachusetts, and we've uh, demonstrated some success. One is that if we're candid with ourselves, we have to admit that if, we ha the, if we're going to have any hope of catching up with our list of long-term deferred systemic infrastructure needs, we've got to cre keep growing our economy. Uh, we could pretend that we could say to ourselves, gee, we know we haven't been investing enough in our infrastructure, and we really feel bad about that, and we're going to try to do better next year, 
and we're going to take a few more dollars out of our public budget, and we really are going to try to fix uh, these issues. Uh, but the reality is um, that there's tremendous demand on public budgets, and there's no practical opportunity, I think, for us to say that we are going to address our long-term infrastructure needs simply by promising to do a little better uh, next year. If we don't grow our economies, grow our tax base, and grow our ability to create public revenue to support these investments, we're never going to catch up. I just don't think that's going to happen. So that's sort of on the one hand. On the other hand, we are in a place where thanks to decades of underinvesting in our infrastructure, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, many other states as well across the United States, we're now at a place where many businesses and developers cannot or will not keep growing in our states without targeted infrastructure support. We simply haven't created the places uh, where new development wants to, to uh, locate, where businesses want to locate. So we're, because of those two fundamental factors and they're working against each other, we're sort of stuck in a trap. Uh, we can't afford to invest more in infrastructure because our, because our economies are not growing and our economies aren't going to be growing unless we invest more in infrastructure. So that's a problem that uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island both face, and it's a hard one. But in Massachusetts, we do believe that by this approach of targeted infra infrastructure investments, including through the MassWorks program that you're going to hear more about, and other programs as well, we ha are really starting to untie this difficult knot. Uh, these targeted investments have helped many Massachusetts businesses and developers to make the decision to grow in Massachusetts. And that ha their having made that decision in turn has improved our prospects of being able to address our long-term systemic infrastructure needs. Uh, so we really, we feel that by making these targeted investments, by adding to the growth, we've had some success both in GDP growth and employment growth over the last 10 years coming out of the Great Recession, performing um, much better than Massachusetts had coming out of the last two big national recessions. And that's given us some capacity to reinvest and we feel like we're getting uh, some positive momentum and the flywheel is starting to turn. And if we have growth that we can invest and invest will lead to growth. And that's the way our state or any state is going to get out of the situation that we're in. Uh, so that's the primary, that's my primary argument for these targeted investments uh, that it begins to help us get out of this box that we're in. There's several other aspects of, of these programs in Massachusetts that have also contributed uh, to their success. Um, one is their, their popular programs uh, with businesses and developers. Uh, public investment in support of infrastructure reduces the upfront cost of a business decision to relocate or expand, which is, also a, which is often a very important factor in the de corporate decision making. Just give you one interesting example of this that really caught my eye. You know that recently uh, GE made the decision to move its corporate headquarters uh, to Boston, which was very exciting for us. They made some decision to invest in Rhode Island as well, which is terrific. Uh, but you heard mostly, you heard Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE, talking about how he wanted GE to be identified as an innovation company. He wanted it to be in a city that was identified with innovation. He wanted to be surrounded by entrepreneurs and startups, and we had those things. Um, and that, is, he, that was his top line message about how he made that relocation decision. But in reading the press about that decision, I noticed also that he said he had structured uh, the move so that it was not going to significantly diminish the earnings of GE for the quarter during which the move would occur. So even a company, big Fortune 100 company like GE, that's trying to be a long-term thinker, uh, the reality of today's marketplace is if you're CEO of a big public company, you've got to focus on your quarterly earnings. So even though when you engage with businesses thinking about locating or expanding, they're talking about strategically, long term, where do they want to be for their talent, their workforce, their customers. They're also very bottom line oriented. So to say we are going to help you uh, make it easier for you to have a, a short-term investment, to reduce your short-term investment in order to make a move uh, can be critically important in a, in a stay or relocate decision. So uh, that has been, it's important. It also reflects well on the state because it reflects that you understand 
uh, those challenges of business and your, you've designed tools uh, that are supportive of that. And I think it lays out the welcome mat for new expanding businesses in a very tangible way and as I said, sends a broader signal to the business community that the state is interested in growth. Uh, so it's well accepted, it's, it's very popular with businesses and the real estate development community. Uh, actually, it's also very well accepted by taxpayers. Public investments in infrastructure, I think, are widely accepted uh, by taxpayers as appropriate public expenditures, whereas tax credits and other kinds of business incentives are not always as well received uh, and are, are questioned and, and criticized. Uh, but I think that people feel that uh, public investment in infrastructure is a traditionally appropriate role of government and the fact that you're announcing that you are improving your infrastructure in order to support new business growth uh, is well received. Particularly where, uh, as with the MassWorks program, the targeted public investments that you're making are being matched by much larger uh, private investments in development and that's something that's easy to explain uh, to the public. And uh, those of us who are or have been uh, economic development officials uh, know you're trying to explain always to the public why you are making good investments, good decisions in promoting uh, economic uh, development. And we come up with all kinds of formulas for if we do this, what, what's the incremental tax revenue, what's the incremental job growth, if you talk to the economic development consultants, we have multipliers to say, oh, well, if we bring this company here, it's not just the 100 jobs they're creating, but that has a ripple effect throughout the economy. We're always trying to figure out ways to explain uh, the value of the actions that we're taking. I found personally that in this program, it's a very simple uh, way to make a case that you're making a common sense investment. If we're spending a million dollars of public funding to signalize intersections or expand sewer capacity. Uh, we're spending a million dollars and at the same time a private uh, investor or company is spending 10 or 20 million dollars to expand a building or to build a new building. Uh, that right there seems like a terrific investment and, and has a lot of credibility. So it's been well received, uh, I think almost uniformly by uh, Massachusetts taxpayers. These investments are also popular uh, with local communities because uh, there you can see the direct uh, impact. And in many cases, uh, when we see uh, local neighborhood or community resistance to new development, uh, when you get right down to it, in many cases, that local resistance or reluctance to see new development uh, is because people feel in their neighborhood their infrastructure systems are already at capacity. So why why, what, why is it a good idea to have new growth in my community when our infrastructure systems aren't even supporting the level of development we have already? So it seems like attention. Yes, okay, new growth is good for the state, but I'm not sure it's good for my community. And we found in many, many cases that if we could say, well, we, we, understand, we at the state could say, we understand that. Um, and we're saying, let's identify what infrastructure improvements are necessary so that this new growth in your community does not burden your neighborhood and we are prepared as a state to make that investment and it really did grease the wheels of a conversation and help us to say that uh, new growth in a particular community could be uh, a win-win and uh, I think uh, the fact that the state is willing, we, in Massachusetts I think we felt strongly that for many of these investments it was important that the state play a role and not just look to the communities to make those investments themselves because of their uh, financial con uh, conditions. So a mass works type investment for example was a much easier conversation than talking about tax increment financing and other local programs. Uh, these kind of targeted infrastructure programs are well accepted by elected officials of both parties. Uh, in Massachusetts, the MassWorks program was started by uh, Governor Deval Patrick, a well-known Democrat. Uh, it was uh, continued and expanded, and I think doubled in size under Governor uh, Charlie Baker, a well-known Republican, and it really never was a contentious or partisan issue. So that's Again, in a, in, a, in a world and in a country where uh, everything seems to be a partisan issue that, to find this uh, kind of program with, that both parties support uh, is another major advantage. The uh, availability, the willingness of the state to make these investments also, also supports the development of public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships in uh, investment in infrastructure and development is a very popular term 
Uh, I will tell you, for those of you here who are in the private sector, uh, there's often a lot of skepticism about the, a public official's use of the term public-private partnership. The suspicion is, well, what you're really saying is there's something that you on the public side used to pay for, and now you feel like you can't pay for it anymore or you don't want to pay for it. So this is your clever way of saying you private people are going to pay for it now, and, uh, but we'll call it a public-private partnership. So the fact that through the MassWorks program and these other programs, we had some money to be able to invest, and when we went and talked about a public-private partnership, we could say, no, we're going to put in some money ourselves. This is going to be a true collaboration. And in fact, we'll go first and say, listen, this is the amount of investment that we're prepared to make. It's not going to solve the entirety of the issue, um, but we can meet you halfway where we have the resources to meet you halfway if you'll meet us halfway as well. And it, and it has changed the conversation in Massachusetts about public-private partnerships because there's a sense in which it is a true spirit of uh, collaboration. Uh, these kind of targeted investments uh, also are uh, very helpful in supporting smart growth. So we know if you take the big picture, long-term life, life cycle view, uh, that smart growth, in addition to being good for the environment and a host of other uh, beneficial aspects, it's actually good business because if we grow uh, and continue to grow in our densely, uh, in our communities that are already uh, uh, urban, walkable urban neighborhoods or other densely developed environments, and we keep things clustered and close, that over the long term, economically, it's much better than spreading or sprawling all across our state, building roads and water lines and sewer lines and, and spreading out. We're just creating an enormous amount of infrastructure that we're going to have a very difficult time. It's going to be very expensive to maintain and repair <coughs> over the entire life cycle. So we know that's true, but on the other hand, when you take the very narrow short-term view, uh, in many cases, smart growth can appear more expensive up front, and in fact can be more expensive up front between brownfields issues, historic preservation challenges, uh, trying to uh, build in neighborhoods where the, that are already densely developed and the infrastructure is already at capacity can mean there are upfront costs to that development uh, that don't necessarily exist for someone who's proposing greenfield uh, development out in a less populated community or a less densely developed area. So in some cases, if we're honest about smart growth, we have to acknowledge uh, it can simply be cheaper and faster for someone to build on a greenfield than to do the kind of development that we'd like to see in the long term. So again, the state being willing to make an upfront investment of that and saying, listen, we're going to be honest with you. We understand that there may be more upfront cost of growing smart, better for the long term, but more upfront. So we're willing to share those with you uh, and to uh, help you in that economic decision that this is uh, the right thing to do. But I hope uh, to kick us off that I have uh, helped make the case that taking some of our precious infrastructure dollars and using them in a targeted fashion and to support a job and, and housing growth uh, is a terrific way to get our economies moving forward.